Please take your copy of God's Word. Let's turn together to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, our text this morning begins in verse 22 and extends to verse 40. We have just seen Jesus perform this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. In many ways, the, the interaction that begins in verse 22 and extends really to the end of the chapter is as a theological reflection on what has just happened. Um, Jesus has, has sustained the lives of these, these people in the crowd uh, by extending five barley loaves and two fish to feed them all until they're, they're all satisfied. But then he's going to say to us, I am the one who satisfies you. I am the bread of life. Come to me to have your hungry heart satiated and satisfied. That's what this passage has for us. It it points us to Jesus who alone can satisfy us. All the things we seek in this world, they'll leave us hungry still. Only Jesus can satisfy. That's the message for us this morning. But we're only going to be able to hear, but even more embrace what Jesus has for us if the Holy Spirit comes to help us. So let's ask him for his help. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we do come to you this morning confessing that we are unable in our own selves to to hear and to understand Holy Scripture. Uh, Paul teaches us that that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. These things are spiritually discerned. And so by the Spirit, we we need to discern what your Word has for us. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray, come. Open our eyes of faith this morning. Illuminate our hearts and minds that we might see great riches in this portion of your Gospel. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, John chapter 6, beginning in verse 22. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. And they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, It was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him, should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I, I think you all know that I'm a, I'm a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. One of my great memories from my adulthood was seeing Bruce and the East Street Band at the height of their powers 
in St. Louis in 2008. It was a great show. They, they played almost for four hours. It was, it was the longest concert on the Magic Tour, uh, the tour of that year in 2008. One of the songs that they played at that concert was uh, one of Bruce's biggest early hits from the River album that came out in 1980, uh, the song Hungry Heart. Uh, Bruce later would tell us that he wrote Hungry Heart as he reflected on a line from a poem that was written by Alfred Lord Tennyson, where Tennyson had written, um, for always roaming with a hungry heart. That, that phrase embedded itself in Springsteen, and he, he turned that phrase into a song of, of wandering hearts and wandering souls that had the the punchy chorus, everyone has a hungry heart. Everyone's got a hungry heart. Lay down your money and you play your part. Everyone's got a hungry heart. And, and Springsteen following Tennyson, I think he articulated something powerful and even universal uh, about the sinful human condition. We are all hungry and thirsty. We are all hungry and thirsty physically, certainly, but, but emotionally and especially spiritually. We're seeking things as we wander about this life that will actually satisfy our soul thirst, our soul hunger, that will fill in the empty parts of us, the parts that ache and long and desire. We are hungry, hungry hearts. And in that regard, we're, we're not that different from these crowds who had been fed by Jesus the day before, but now have woken up in the morning and they are looking for Jesus. And as they seek Jesus, they show us what, what they, but, but especially what we, are seeking. If you use your imagination, these opening verses of what we read are actually pretty funny. There's only one boat they noted, the crowds noted the day before. But when they wake up in the morning, the disciples are gone, Jesus is gone, the boat is gone, and they know that Jesus hasn't gotten in the boat. And they're kind of looking around like, where did he go? W where did Jesus go? And so they, they make a determination that they need to find Jesus. That's what verse 24 tells you. You see it in your Bibles? John records, so when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Now, in, in John's gospel, generally speaking, when, when, the, when the crowd is seeking Jesus, that's not necessarily a good thing. In our mind, oh, the crowds are seeking Jesus. They must want to believe in him. No, most of the time when the crowds are seeking Jesus, they want to do him harm. That's not fully the case here, at least not in the section we read. Starting with verse 41, they become much more oppositional and even hostile. But here, while the, while the crowd's desires don't, don't become violent yet, they're not benevolent either. They're seeking Jesus, yes, but they're seeking certain things from Jesus. And in, certain, in seeking these certain things from Jesus, they show us what we seek. Now, the first thing they're seeking is, is power, not the passion. Now, we can't forget, as the crowd is seeking Jesus, the, the one time the crowd speaks, at least in John chapter 6. Do you remember what they said? It's in John chapter 6 and verse 14, after Jesus is fed the 5,000, after uh, the loaves, the leftover loaves and fishes are collected, filling 12 baskets, the crowd says this, when the people saw the sign that he had done, John 6, 14, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come to the world. This is the prophet. This is the one that Moses had promised, a prophet like Moses, one who would be prophet, priest, and king. And so verse 15 tells you that because they see him as the promised prophet, they want to seize him and make Jesus king by force, which is why Jesus gives them the slip and he goes to the top of the mountain. But just because Jesus has given the crowd the slip and, and the night has fallen, it doesn't mean their desires have changed. No, they've woken up in the morning seeking Jesus so that they might make him king by force. And why do they want to do that? Why do they want to make Jesus king? Well, because they want power. They want to use Jesus 
to gain something for themselves, namely, they want a king they can control. They want power represented in a king that would represent them. Of course, that temptation's always been present in this world. That, that people would seek Jesus, that people would use Jesus in order to gain power. I mean, for every politician that is married together the flag and the cross, and so gained, tried to use Jesus to gain power, you have thousands of less well-known people who have who've joined churches for business connections or have used their relationships to magnify their power in the community or to use their relationships to magnify their power inside the church. Some of us have done that. We, we've, we've come to church, not, not so that we might gain Jesus, but so that we might gain power. But of course, that's not why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come to increase your power or mine. Rather, Jesus came to give his life away, to suffer. He came for the passion. He came to be lifted up. And so, so by being lifted up, to draw men and women to himself so that we might trust in him and, and rest in him. And the crowds weren't looking for that kind of savior. They were looking for a savior who would be powerful, not a, not a, suffer, not a suffering savior, not a crucified savior. That, that's why Paul would say, as we've already seen in the last couple of weeks in 1 Corinthians, that the word of the cross is folly, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. Why? Because the cross represents powerlessness. It represents a way of salvation that does not bring power but suffering. That's why it's folly. And if the crowds knew that Jesus had come to be crucified, they would have said he was foolish too. It shows that their heart, like our hearts, are hungry for power, not the passion. But, but their hearts, like our hearts, they're, they're hungry too for gifts, but not the giver. When, when the crowds finally find Jesus... What do they say to him? You see it in verse 25? They, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Notice they ask when. They don't ask how. Of course, we've already seen that they've done the math. There was one boat. The disciples went in the boat. Jesus didn't get in the boat. How did Jesus get to Capernaum, five miles across the sea, a lengthy hike around the mountains? They don't want to ask the how question. So they ask instead, Rabbi, when did you get here? And, but Jesus doesn't answer that curiosity question, does he? What does Jesus say instead? Well, verse 26, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Now, of course, they saw the signs. Right? They ate the sign as Jesus took the barley loaves and the fishes and distributed them. And they multiplied in such a way that 5,000 men plus women and children besides were all fed and were all satiated. They, they certainly saw the sign, but they didn't see the sign. All they saw were, were the gifts. All they saw was, was Jesus giving them the good gifts that would actually satisfy their, their hungry bellies. They, they weren't looking for the giver of those gifts. They wanted those gifts still. They didn't want Jesus. But again, I don't, I don't know how different we are. I mean, as, as Presbyterians, we rightly reprobate the prosperity gospel teachers like, like Joel Osteen or Joyce Myers or others who say that Jesus came so that you and I might be healthy, wealthy, and wise. We rightly say they are wrong doctrinally and are to be rejected and not to be followed. But... I wonder if it could be the case that even rejecting the prosperity gospel teachers doctrinally, we don't in our heart of hearts actually have a similar kind of theology where we want the gifts that we, we really want and, and expect and, and desire. We're hungry for our best lives now because we want the nice homes and the vacation spots and the private school education and the country club memberships and, and we want good health and good food and drink and good friends and good kids. We want all the gifts. We want all the good things, the goodies of life. But, but do we really want the giver of those gifts? 
I don't know. Do we? Do we want Jesus? When Jesus begins taking those, those good gifts away in order to test our hearts, how do we respond? Do we respond with Job, naked I came into the world, naked I will leave this world, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Is that how we respond? Because we were really after the giver all along or were we angry and bitter and deeply anxious? He's taking this good gift. He's going to take this good gift too? As though God is a harsh God, as though Jesus is an uncaring God. Doesn't it really actually show we weren't after the giver all along just his gifts? Certainly the crowds were in that place, weren't they? The crowds were seeking the power, not the passion. They were seeking the gifts, not the giver. But there's one other thing they were seeking. They were seeking works, not the way of faith. Jesus goes on to tell them in verse 27, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And so Jesus warns the crowds not, not to work for perishing food, but for eternal food. And obviously this is a metaphor. It's meant to, to waken them from their, from their sensate stupor. They are seeking power. They're seeking gifts. They're laboring for food that's going to perish. They're not looking for Jesus. And they would miss out on real, true, abundant, eternal life. But they still don't get it. They, they ask the question that every religious person asks. What must we do? What are we supposed to do to work the works of God? And, and even when Jesus tells them that the work of God isn't really a work, but a resting a receiving, a relying upon Jesus, they, they still don't get it. Because in the end, we really do seek our own doing. We really seek our own working. We, we really are engaged in self-justification projects in the end. That somehow, even if it's our own deciding to believe, we have something that we can bring before God on the last day. Something, some way that we can stand on our own two feet and say, I did this. But that's not the way that Jesus sets before us. No, he, the way he sets before us is faith alone in him. And that faith is a passive faith. It's a receiving faith, a receptive faith. And that's not really what we're seeking at all. We, we find ourselves saying, as Martin, Lu Martin Luther has it, what? Do we do nothing do we work nothing for the obtaining of this righteousness? To which Luther replies, I answer nothing at all. The nature of this righteousness is to do nothing, to hear nothing, to know nothing whatsoever of the law or of works, but to know and believe this only. Christ has gone to the Father and is not now seen. He sits in heaven at the right hand of his Father, not as a judge, but made for us God, by God, wisdom, righteousness, holiness, and redemption. We do nothing. We work nothing. We simply receive this good word, this word of promise that Jesus stands for us at the right hand of the Father. Wisdom, righteousness, holiness, and redemption. That's what Jesus is saying here. That's why Jesus says, this is the work of God, to believe in him whom he sent. In other words, we, when we fail to seek the right thing, uh, in, instead of seeking power, or gifts, or works, when we fail to seek the right thing, we're not in a position to give what Jesus himself shares. Jesus wants to bring us to the place where we see how empty all of these other pathways are to, to satisfy our hungry hearts so that we'll have open hands to receive what he shares. Starting in verse 30, it, it becomes clear that the crowd is, is starting to get what Jesus is saying. They're, they ask him, what sign will you do that will cause us to believe you? They, they show that at least intellectually they grasp what he's saying, but they really don't, do they? They don't really get it. Because, because what Jesus intends to share 
with those who come to him is nothing less than himself. Jesus shares not, not power, not gifts, not works. Jesus shares himself. And already in verse 33, he, he gives you that sense. Look at verse 32. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. You see, Jesus is cluing the crowd in that the true bread from heaven, the bread of God, isn't a what, it's a who. It isn't a possession, it's a person. And in case they miss it, it comes clear in verse 35. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Of course, this statement in verse 35, I am the bread of life, is the first of the I am statements that Jesus will make in John's gospel. We'll note them all as we continue in this gospel. But the first one's vital. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the bread from God for the life of the world, and he's giving himself. Jesus is giving his very own self to us and for us that we might live. But but we don't come to Jesus that we might have life. We come to Jesus that we might have Jesus. That's what he says to us. Whoever comes to me, when we come to Jesus, we gain Jesus. And we gain Jesus as the one who is our very justification. He is the justifying God. So that we don't don't continue on in our self-justification project. No, we're, we're content to rest in Jesus who gives himself to us and whom we receive with with empty hands. And in gaining Jesus, we gain everything. We, we, We have himself, yes, but we also have his life. And Jesus' life is a life in which we never hunger again. It's it's one in which we never thirst again, just as Jesus told the Samaritan woman by the well, remember, in John chapter 4, that If you come to this well, you're going to thirst again, but the water I will give you will be water that springs up within you and springs up to eternal life. Jesus promised the Samaritan woman that he would satisfy her soul thirst, and when she believes that he's the Messiah of the world, her soul is satisfied. Jesus says that to you this morning, that if you leave off all of the things you're seeking to somehow satiate your hungry heart and simply come to Jesus with empty hands and say, Jesus, I believe in you and I'm resting upon you and I receive you and I'm relying upon you, not my own doing, not the gifts you give, not the power that I seek, I'm relying upon you. Jesus gives us himself, but he also gives us his very life so that we, our souls are finally satisfied and we're hungry no more. And when, when Jesus shares himself with us, his sharing with us of himself secures both our now and our then. There's, there's security and confidence for us now, and there's security and confidence for us then. That's what Jesus secures for us. I mean, what is Jesus sharing of himself with us now, secure for us now? Well, Jesus goes on to say in verse 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Here's here's a word of promise for you now, that as you live this life and you have all of these things, these these temptations around you to try to somehow satisfy your heart with with power and gifts and, and doing And and the gospel comes to you Sunday by Sunday. You say, no, leave off all of that. Rest your heart in Jesus. And you wonder, is that enough? Is it enough simply to be passive and receptive and simply receive Jesus over and over and over again as we come to him daily, daily dying, daily receiving? Is that enough? This word comes to us and says, it is enough. Those who come to me, I'll never cast away. This was the verse that the English Puritan John Bunyan used with his own heart to, to, to rest finally in Christ. Bunyan, in his testimony, written out as Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, said this, 
Satan would greatly labor to pull this promise from me, telling me that Christ did not mean me, and such as I, but sinners of a lower rank, that had not done what I had done. But, but I should answer him, Satan, there is in this word no such exception, but him that comes, any him, him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. In our English versions, it's whoever. Whoever comes to me. If you are a he or a she this morning, you fit in whoever. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. That is a word of promise of what Jesus secures for you now. Confidence that if you rest in Jesus Christ and receive him as, as the bread of life that satisfies your hungry heart, he'll never throw you away. He'll never cast you out. But that's a good word, not just for now. No, Jesus secures the word of promise for you then. And, and the then has to do with, you, with your dying day. Jesus promises that he will not lose you in your dying day. Do you see what he says? Verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. That, that language in verse 39, look at it again. That I should lose nothing of all that he's given me. Do you, do you know the last time in John's gospel that language is used? To lose nothing? It's just a few verses before. At, at the end of the feeding of the 5,000, what does Jesus say? Well, it's John chapter 6, verse 12. When they had eaten their fill, Jesus told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. Fast forward a few verses. Truly, truly, I say to you, excuse me, verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing. Listen, if Jesus cares so much for leftovers that he tells his disciples, take care of them, gather them up, Nothing can be lost. Nothing shall be lost. If Jesus cares like that for leftovers, won't he care much more for you on the last day? That you won't be lost. You won't be cast aside. When you come to your dying day, whether it's at home or in the hospital room or it's cat death catches you unawares, and you wonder, is Jesus going to keep his promise to me to be that food that satisfies me all the way to eternal life? Will Jesus make sure that I am with him in heaven? Jesus says, look, if I care for leftovers, won't I care for you and your dying day? Won't I, be, won't I take, this is the will of my Father, that I will care for you, that you will not be lost. Or when, when you come to the resurrection day, and, and the trumpets shall sound, and your body will be put together again with your soul, and your body's made new, to, to be in a place that's made new again, and full flourishing, then you wonder, will Jesus, will he bring me to the resurrection day? Jesus says, this is the will of my Father. If I care for leftovers, I will certainly care for you. And I will raise you up in the last day. Friends, with that kind of confidence in the, in the end, in our future, in our dying day, and in the resurrection day, shouldn't we able to be able to say now for me to live as Christ and to die as gain? I mean, sometimes we wonder if that's true for me to live as Christ and to die. Dying as gain? To leave my spouse, to leave my children, to leave my grandchildren, to leave my parents, my grandparents, dying is gain. Jesus says, yes. Why? Because I'm the bread of life. I have satisfied your hungry heart. I'm the one who's promised I will not lose you. Just as I care for those bread fragments because you've taken of me and you are resting in me, I will not lose you in the last day. I shall raise you from the dead. And to be absent from the body now is to be present with the Lord. Trust me. Rest your heart in me, Jesus says. So the good news of the gospel for us today is if we're here this morning with hungry hearts, Jesus himself stands ready to save you and ready to satisfy you. He stands in your midst and he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger. Whoever comes to me shall never thirst. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Jesus, you are a friend for sinners. You are one who saves us to the uttermost.
not just in this present life. Surely you give us a word of confidence so that we might trust in you and rest in you and not chase after what this world offers us in this vanity fair. But you give us an even better word for then, that you will raise us up in the last day, that we are not fools to believe the word of the cross and the word of the empty tomb. We're not fools to, 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 to rest our hearts in the one who, is, who said, I am the bread of life. And so, Lord, satisfy us. Feed us till we want no more. Be for us the bread of heaven. And grant us your grace, we ask. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.